A part of monopoly, when we discuss a monopoly, one of the part is your price distribution. How does a firm a distribute prices on the basis of location, on the basis of the market, on the basis of locality, on the basis of ages? Now for the old age people, they have some different price distribution. So here in this part, we are going to discuss three kind of price distribution. Before going to discuss this one, the first one is what is a consumer surplus. So just now I was, Vijay was telling to them is that um, if you go to the coating, they, they bring a glass which shows the ray bell. When they, they, they quote you like that, sir, this is a original brand. But the cost of that glass is around 300 to 400 or 500 maximum. But he quotes you around 1500 to 2000 rupees. Why he quotes like that? Because he tried to extract more profit from the, the consumer. But the point is that when you take a bag, for the lady's bag, it's costing him 200 or 300 rupees maximum in quoting. But he, he shows such a marketing skill that it costs you more than 1000 rupees. Madam, this is in the mall, it is 1000 rupees. But at last he tried to convince you that he will sell you at around 600, 700 rupees. So what is the original price of the, your, uh, the product is 200 rupees. What you are giving is 700 rupees. So 400 rupees is a profit where the consumer is willing to pay and able to pay more than the market price of the product. That's what basically consumer says. This is what a consumer which calculated by analyzing the difference between what consumer is willing and able to pay for goods and services related to the, the market prices. That's what we call a, a consumer surpluses. The market price is around 200 rupees and the selling price is around the seven. The difference between the both is your consumer surplus. The same thing we represent here in terms of a graph. So here on the x-axis we are measuring the output, on the y-axis we are measuring the, the prices. This is your a demand curve which is a downward sloping. It also represents the inverse relationship between your demand and the price. So here your actual market price is P0 for your product. But the seller is trying to extract the P1 level of price and this price is what actually the consumer surplus for a, a seller and also the way a producer is extracting the more profit from the a customer at the initial point of time. Okay. This is where consumer surplus. So when we talk about it, we have three degree of, uh, three types of uh, price. One is first degree of price estimation, uh, second degree of price estimation and third degree of uh, price estimation. So here uh, when we talk about a first degree of price it is called a, a perfect price discrimination. Why we call a perfect uh, price discrimination is that what he is doing is that a simple example I want to tell is that monopolist is trying to sell his unit uh, where he can charge higher prices. Whenever you go for any new January if you go for the, any mall where we see the fresh arrivals are really prices will be very high. Why the the prices are very high at that point of time because it's a fresh arrival to the market and there are people who are ready to buy that kind of product at the time also. So what is happening is that he is charging the highest price on the willing customers. He is not charging the prices on unwilling customers. He is charging the highest price on the willing customers who are able to buy that product. So in the same way, we can represent that's what you are telling. This is your the market price. The PM is your market price, but if he buys at this price, this is his total revenue for that firm. But if he buys here, this is above the market price, this is an extra surplus for the producers where he can try to make a more profit or highest prices he is charging on the customers to do this one. But here one hurdle is that, how do you decide this pricing to attract the customer? Abnormal pricing cannot happen. Today I have sent some product to the market, I cannot price as my willing and wish. So here one difficult is that the first uh, degree of pricing, it's very difficult to assess, that's why. It's very difficult to assess what pricing I should fix for the product. Okay, for the quote we went, it is a bargain between two parties. But once the product comes to the mall or things, there is no bargaining business. Then if they see that the price is acceptable, they buy the product. If they don't see that the price is acceptable, they go for other drugs. 
then how do you mold your customers is a biggest task in the case of uh, first degree price. That's why here whenever they charge higher prices, they should consider whether the customers are willing to buy that particular product or not. So when you come to the second degree of price discriminations, is where uniform prices are charged according to the unit prices. As your quantity of your product increases, the prices will come down. So this is where we call also a block pricing. For the first block, this much pricing. For the second block, this much pricing. For the third block, this much pricing. So this we can represent by the graphical representation is that. Where we can see that here again on the y-axis we have price. On the x-axis we have output. Now the point is that I assume this P1 has a mu variable or this is a Q1 quantity which is charged at the P1 prices. When the prices are very high, we demand less. As the prices are coming down, demand is the quantity demand for your goods is increasing. As further decreases, I was telling that KG sari. If you see, if you go during the Dasara or the Deepavali time, the full rush will be there in the malls. Because automatically the prices are coming down. As the prices are coming down, the quantity of purchase has increased. Today we have the retail market is there, wholesale market is there. Retail marketing prices are different and wholesale marketing prices. So if you go to the Surat, they bring in a lot. When they are giving us in a cages, maybe they get in a different rate there. So if you buy in a bulk, the prices will change. If you buy in a single quantity, the prices will change. That's why for every block, the prices are changed. That's why you call as a, a block pricing. If you buy a P1 of the block, the Q1 is your quantity you buy. At the P2 pricing block, you buy Q2 uh, quantity. And P3 is your Q3 output. This is where you can also say that as the prices are coming down, you are demanding the more goods and services from the market. And the third reason, where we can see this one, uh, uh, recently there was a report that Marcus Mark Suski export 15 lakhs back into the international market. Now the point why I am bringing this one is that, when we talk about a third degree of uh, price discrimination, here we are making that, how does a, a company try to make a profit by exporting their goods and services? The same company producing the two goods, for one for the domestic market, one for the international market. And what is the motive behind this one is, uh, how to extract more profit? The same cost of production is happening here. Little bit we assess the quality. One is that if you are exporting to international market, we should fulfill the certain quality requirement to, to take care of that one. But the, all major things are same. But producing here, where the cost of production is very less here, but we are selling in the international market where our prices are charged the dollar. So what happens? There is more profit for the firms. So here in the third degree of price discrimination, we are discriminating our prices on the basis of geographical distance. And I also said in the search prices, peak and off, peak times, and domestic overseas markets. If you buy the product in the on the Indranagar main road, the prices will be different. If you buy here in Goldadi, the prices are different. So the, the same product charged a different price in the different places. So how does this helps to maximize the profit for the a firm in the long term? This is the most important thing. So that's why you see this one actually what is the elasticity says? It is if it is a more vertical, it is inelastic. Any price change in your product, there is a demand for your goods. That's why if you see this one is a, a perfectly a near real relatively inelastic. Means even a small percentage change in your price doesn't impact you. That's why he is charging the highest price at this monopoly kind of a situation where he is having a QA quantity of your demand for your product in the market. As this goes turn like this, this as it's coming becoming more of a straight line, what is happening? You are going towards the perfect competition. If it is become a strike like this, that becomes a, a perfect competition where there is a n number of substitute of goods are there, where the pricing plays a very crucial role. So this is a market where he is charging the higher price, but if you come to the market B, the prices are 
has come down because as your demand curve and marginal revenue curve has become a little bit more flatter. As a more flatter it is becoming means there's a more competition in the market is there. As a result, what happens is that I cannot charge a higher price in the market. This is a PA which is I'm charging for the QA quantity of product. In the market B, I'm charging the PB price for the QB quantity. Yes, quantity has increased. As we know that as the prices come down, the quantity. But if we merge these two, A and B market, this is the upper part is a monopoly kind of a market, and the downer part is the very much of a, a perfect more of a elastic market where the influence of your price change has on your demand. But in the case of group market A, the influence of your the percentage change in your price has a lesser impact on percentage change in your demand. Because it is inelastic. This is an inelastic kind of a nature. Whatever the product which is, this is a monopoly market. We are talking about a monopoly market. I am the producer, single producer who is in the market. I want to extract more profit from that market. If I am exporting this product to the international market where there is no competition, whatever the price I charge, they should buy it. But the demand may be less. But there is a demand for my product at that particular price of PA. But here, it will be domestic market where our economic structure also plays a very crucial role. The income group also plays a very crucial role. I cannot charge the same price what I am charging in the international market. So the prices of your group B market, it automatically comes down. But the cost of production is the same for the two markets. The cost of production is your the C. Here is the C. Because we are in one plant only we are producing goods and services. So when the cost of production is the same, but we are selling a different price in a different market. We are selling a different price in, the, in this particular market where the monopoly of domination is there, I am selling higher prices. Where the lesser monopoly domination is there, I am selling at a lower price. Or you can tell in different market, one is international market, one is domestic market. Where this is international market, I am selling at higher prices, whereas in the domestic market, I am selling. But overall, both if you average, he is making a profit of PM level in the when in club group A and the group B market, we are making a profit of PM, the cost remains the same for the three in the market. As a result, as your MC and MR is touching the point, this is the price which we are selling, the average price of the two market is, the PM is you are selling the price of the market at both the market. So when we average the both A, A market and B market, this is where our demand for A and B product at the market for that particular company. Are you getting the idea? So here is more of a inelastic, more of a elastic. And when you compare merge this two figure, you can remember this part is upper part. And this is a more elastic is this B market. When you merge A market and B market, what is my average selling price in the market? What is my average cost from the both the market? So this is my cost, this is my profit of the by selling my the price in the market. So this is where we can say that the monopoly is making to charge higher price to make the more profit in the, the market. That's what when the price elasticity is different in two market segment segment. The profit maximum will charge higher market price in the market where demand is less elastic. He charges more prices where there is a less elastic. It is more elastic. It is a lesser. Whenever there is a monopoly trying to charge, whether there is an individual player plays a crucial role. That's why he is charging the higher price in the third market. As a result of that one, the average profit of the firm will increases over a period of time. Anything to ask? <coughs> okay. Uh, this is the one more. This is just I uh, give this uh, look uh, one more broad. What is the first degree of price distribution? The first thing we call is a perfect price distribution. Why we call it perfect price distribution? The customers are willing to pay at whatever the prevailing price in the market. As a result of that one, the firm is trying to extract more consumer surplus from the customer. So as a result of that one, what is happening? The firm is making a more profit at initial level. But when we come to second pricing, we call it as a uniform pricing or a block pricing. As price at higher price, we have a lesser block. As the prices comes down, 
quantity as the quantity is increasing the prices of your the products are coming down in the market but the third market is very important market where we are talking about two important thing if we are talking about elastic elasticity less elasticity and more elasticity when there is a more less elasticity the prices will be very high when there is more more elastic the prices will be less on an average the firm is trying to extract more profit in a less elastic market than the more elastic market this is a thread in which you want to explain through the graphical representation okay fine i don't stress much on this area uh, mono when you talk about a monopoly and monopolistic i'll give the difference is that here uh, when you talk about a monopolistic competition how does it differ from the monopoly the first what is a monopoly sir here is that in a perfect competition we were n number of sellers and buyers were there but here in monopolistic competition we are slightly lesser number of uh, sellers and buyers than the perfect competition that's why there are many firms producing a slightly different product and although they are in a competition with each other their product is unique in some way their product are unique so for example if you take a soap Uh, mysore sandal is a flat soap mysore sandal is a flat soap if you take it down there is a gap in the shape in the dimension so in terms of their shapes their change their colors that's where we can see the uniqueness in their some way for some brand the shape is like uniqueness for that brand because when you hold like this it is a grip for you to hold that soap so what happens is that we are any product some uniqueness will be there for us if you take in a, a phone sector apple is a unique phone But there are n number of phones are in the market, but Apple has its own space in the market. So Apple has a unique space in the, the market. So thereby giving this product certain degree of monopoly. Before one place, Apple was a dominant unit for in the market. But one place came, the presence of one place has impacted the Apple. It may be different, is it? Maybe price matters, quality matters, that may be it. But it has impacted. So in the same way, because one place has become a unique product, that's why they are making higher profit. The elastic is less elastic. Even if it is one lakh eighty thousand, there is demand for that the product. That uniqueness uh, makes a firm to be sustained in the market in the case of the monopoly. So what are these the different kind of uh, features of the monopoly? What is that the same? The large number of buyers and sellers, but less than the a perfect competition. Product differentiation. How does the product differentiation happen on the basis of the physical differences so i was saying that the shampoo colors texture uh, flavor all this make a differences for your physical differences and second is that location i was saying that before uh, sache was introduced it was only urban oriented shampoos but once the sache was introduced it became the total market uh, product in the market it became uh, what do you call a rural product also in the market now example services nowadays we have uh, dominos pizza dominos uh, zomato all these the services because to attract more customer to make them uh, more lazy people we are providing all kind of again uh, product image i was saying that dow uh, image is different lux image is different and light boy image is different so all this a different product differentiation makes their respective product unique in its own way so as a result of that one as a result of as a result of that one they have their market if you go by paste sensodyne is one of the paste which has made its image in the market but there is many paste are there the colgate is there pomelo or many many other but sensodyne has its own place in the market because of uniqueness of its product you ever seen that in the paste below there will be red color blue color and green color what is this no flavor red means more chemical no sensodyne no, it is related not that one if you if you see the paste below there will be a red color box blue color box yeah. if, if the red if red is there it's a more chemical paste if the blue and green is there the blue is lighter lesser and green is a more more of organic kind of a thing means on that basis also the prices also vary for your product so again the free entry fee exists selling cost this is a different thing okay see this is i was studying shape these are the few brands which has unilever has occupied in the market i was thinking the vaseline is indian product i was thinking of one more product uh, what is this little little is they have two one is a uh, teased by this people and one more is same 
Hilton is branded under the under the other brand also. So this is the brand which Unilever holds in the market. So this I not uh, discuss much. It's not required for people. Okay, what are the uh, basic difference between monopoly and the monopolistic market? Here in a monopoly we have a single seller, but here we have many sellers, many buyers, but less than the a perfect competition. Number of players are one. Here, two to ten or even more players are their market, and product differentiation in the monopoly extreme, whereas in the case of monopolistic, slightly different. That's why every product has slight difference in their own way. Again, degree of control over the price. Monopoly has a highly control over the prices, but monopolistic have some control over the price because of the uniqueness of their product. Competition, no, in monopoly there is no competition, but in monopolistic there exists a competition because they have number of players are more in the competition. But in the case of monopoly, they are only one player, so there is no concept of competition exists in the in monopoly. Demand curve, a monopoly, it's a more of a steep. But in the case of monopolistic, more of a, a flat. Again, barriers to entry, the monopoly, there exists a control, many controls are there, but in here, in the monopolistic, there is no control of entry and exist. What is the difference between form and industry? There is no difference in the case of monopoly because there is only one form exists, so there is no difference between the forms and industry. But in the case of monopolistic, as more number of players are there, so there is a difference between the, the firm and industry. What is the difference between form and industry? If individual company or any day's individual firm is there, but accumulation of all the firm, we call it as a industry. So this is where we can see a small difference between the monopoly and the monopolistic competition. Not required. So <coughs> the last one is the oligopoly. Here oligopoly uh, is a market where very few players are there. Why I gave the previous example is that So these are the uh, service provider. Now, how many are existing now? The Reliance Geo is existing. The BSN and anyway, they are collapsing. Bharti is only now the three major players we can say in the market for the service. One is that the Reliance, Vodafone, and Bharti Theater. But most of the players are the Tata Com has gone, Reliance Com, they are on the bankrupt. So MTN and they are merging with the uh, other. So, so what is happening is that in the longer term, this many firms which are at the initial level become the two or three major players in the market. Tomorrow, Vodafone will not be there. Vodafone will merge with somebody else. Idea anyway, Vodafone ideas are merging. Now, Airtel and Reliance and Vodafone, three major players are there. So what is happening is that when we had a, a perfect competition market, we are we are turning towards the, the oligopoly market. That's what uh, here also if you see that uh, top five smartphone companies in India, the 2017 data. This is now Lenovo is not there in the picture also. So Vivo is there. Xiaomi, uh, which is now it is 27. Where is that new figure? Okay, uh, this is 27 percentage now. They are having a market share. There are Samsung and others are there. So this Lenovo is not there in the market again. Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, all are three are Chinese companies. Plus 50 percent of the market share of the Chinese companies in the Indian market. So you can understand that how the companies are becoming more of a oligopoly kind of. That's why uh, here uh, only few firms makes a dominant uh, decision making in the the oligopoly. That's why we now we can say that Airtel, Vodafone, and Nike. These three firms have become the major players compared to the earlier. There are many service providers were there, but now only we have three major players. So here. Each form is of a sufficiently large size that the decision taken by the one form will be impact the other forms. That's what decision taken by one form is now. For example, when Airtel said that we are going to increase the price. Now others are also the following the pattern. Vodafone and Geo is also increasing the price of your service price. So they are whatever in oligopoly, the decision when they become the three big players, their decisions are done on the mutually. Independent or dependence. They are depends. They make a decision on understanding each other. For example, if you see, go to the any uh, area where hospital, OP charges is 300 rupees. If you go to other hospital, also OP charges is 300 rupees. It is a, a formal, informal agreement between the hospitals that you also say charge same price. I also charge same price. 
which you go to any area, if the OP price is 300 rupees, all the OP price in that area is 300 rupees. But if you go to Banjara Hills area, OP price will be different. So this is where a few players make a decision. I right, go on this side, remove now. What does it scale? Okay, fine, this one is required. What is this collusion basically? We have the collusion concept is there. See here basically, uh, the collusion means the firms are coming together in terms of fixing the prices and output. So best example is that here, to what price should be charged for the product. And second, at what level of output should be produced to make possible that oligopolist acquires a monopoly. And third one is that the maximum maximizing the profit even. So the best example we can give is that OPEC. You heard of OPEC? We have two kind of a collision. One is a formal collision, which we can call as this oil producing exporting countries, where every year they come into the agreement that what barrel I should produce there, oil per day. Means for example, if there's 8 lakhs to 10 lakhs barrel per day, they can extract the oil from the ground. Then how does it impact on the price? What price I should charge? This is they come into the collusion that where they can extract a more profit from the market. That's why if you they decide that we are reducing the output, then automatically the prices will shoot up. So they have more a profit. That's why whenever the OPEC has a meeting, all other countries who are depending more on the crude oil, they will be eyeing on that meeting. What is their decision? There will be international pressure on these countries that don't decrease the extraction of oil. Because if you decrease the extraction of oil, automatically the supply will cut down. As supply will cut down, automatically the prices will shoot up. So as a result, our trade deficit will also goes up. So as a result of this one, very important. But this kind of a collision is illegal in many ways. They don't allow any kind of this uh, uh, collision kind of a things in there. Uh, US and England also they have this kind of a thing where they are not allowed to do some kind of formal collision in the market. Uh, this is a uh, if one uh, that's why if a little changes its price, others will also the, the same pattern of change. That is what we call as a tactic, uh, a tactic collision where the one leader it changes the prices, other will also the follows him. This is we call as a tactic collision. So this here, just this is for uh, to know this uh, concepts. I, I think this is where. So I will say that I would like to add around eight, six stack to eight lakhs barrel a day to the market, helping that oil prices are sort of multi year. Means they decide that if any kind of a decision taken, if they want to reduce the oil extraction, then the automatic prices will go. If they extract the more oil, automatically the price. This is where the collusion happens between the OPEC countries that we make a decision on the price and the output in the market. So this is we really done with this is not required, this is the other things. Okay, uh, this is we done with this market. Now, uh, another important topic is what is monetary policy. Here we are going to discuss about, uh, you may have heard in the paper that the quarterly monetary policy reports will come. They say that your report rate has decreased on the basis of your inflation of your country. If your inflation is less, they try to decrease your uh, report rate or not. Here we are going to focus on what is the major objective of your monetary policy, first thing. Then the instrument of monetary policy to control any up and ups and down in your economy. It will be uh, recession, it will be depression, or it will be inflation. Whatever the, what, what kind of a instruments are used by the Reserve Bank of India to control your inflation in your economy. So what is that overall, the monetary policy is framed by the, our is the Central Bank of India. Every country has a Central Bank of India which looks into the monetary policy activities. So here we have a specific call 1964 RBI, 1934 RBI where the for certain guidelines and regulations are assigned for the RBI which can perform from uh, time to time. <coughs> what are the objectives of your uh, monetary policy? One is the ensuring price stability or to see that the inflation is under control. Why is price stability is the most important thing for an economy? We talk about inflation, we talk about the price stability. Why one of the major objective of your monetary policy is that the price stability. The price stability is just more on that price stability. Whenever we see that any change in your uh, instruments or other rates, they say that inflation is under the control. Why is this more than on the inflation? Because the price stability will tell that 
how much your economy is able to control your pricing policies. Or if the prices are very high, what happens? The value of your money will the come down. The purchasing power of your currency will fall down. How does it impact on a total economy? Why that other country will also bother about the inflation of our country? If the prices goes up higher, what happens in the general demand and supply format? When the prices goes up in the economy, automatically the demand will come down. When the demand will comes down, automatically when the demand will come down, the producers are not willing to produce more goods and services in the economy. Because there is no incentive for them to produce when the prices are very high, not because of the internal cost of production. It is because of other economic factors. Today, for example, we take example, the crude oil prices shoots up again, higher. What happens? The transportation cost goes up. As the transportation cost goes up, does other people will take, they will also increase the price of the goods and services. As the price of the goods and services goes up, automatically people will demand less goods and services. So one of the important objective of your monetary policy is to see that the price stability should be under the, the control. Whenever any kind of ups and downs happens in your the pricing policy, the RBA comes into the picture. What, the, what are the actions they take? We'll discuss later. But one of the objective of your monetary policy to see is that the price stability. The second one, to encourage economic growth. How does this price stability will influence your growth? That's why today, if the prices are under the control, there's a more demand for your goods and services. As there's a more demand for your goods and services, the more productions will happen. As the more productions will happen, more employment opportunities is created, more income is created, more national income will be increased. This is a cycle. Once demand is more, the productions will be more. As the productions will be more, we want more people to produce goods and services. So employment will go up. As the employment will go, the wages will increase. The income will be in the hands of the people. The consumer spending will increase. As the consumer spending will increase, again, the demand for your goods and services will increase. Your total national income will increase over a period of time. I was telling yesterday that the market for goods and services. Why? The international companies are coming to India. Because there is a data that your income is going to be tripled by 2025. Once income is going to be by tripled by 2025, there is more demand for your goods and services. The more demand for the luxurious product. So as a result of that one, the more production activity takes place. As the more production activity takes place, more employment is created in the system. We never heard that Kia will come to India. It came to India. They started their big plan. The lacks of employment opportunity is created. Not only employment opportunity is created, the surrounding area infrastructure is also developed. As the infrastructure developed, the housing pricing went up. Construction boom took place. The new shops started to emerge there. See how this plays a crucial role in terms of creating employment opportunity in the system. That's so why Hyderabad, this financial district 10 years back, nothing was there. It became the hub for the software industries. Why? The government of the other Pradesh, they, they made this a special economic zone. You come here, we allocate a land for you, we give a tax holiday for you, you start your company here. Why? We are encouraging them to start this because by getting in one company here, the other companies can also come up, occupy here. Today, Chennai is famous for auto industries. There's a big auto industries line. All the big, big, big companies papers are available in Chennai. When the Kia started in another board, 80% employee came from the Chennai. They don't know Telugu. It's a very big problem for them. And what are the advantage? The mediator made a big profit there. What are the rent for houses? One lakh rent, one lakh also. They buy the one big house, it's one lakh per month. And what is the commission? If you mediator gets one house, the one lakh should be given to him on a first rent. So this is where your system will help you in terms of development activities. That's why whenever there is a more productional activity happens, the more income is generated, the more employment opportunity is created, automatically your national income will grow. As a result, again, as the national income will grow, 
the income is distributed in terms of a per capita income. Again, the per capita income will grow. So this is a cycle, where this cycle should not break. If the cycle breaks, today what is happening, there is a lack of demand in the system. The people are saying that there is no income with them. The farm, the rural sector is in the back. What is happening is that because of that, that there is no demand in the system. How to create a demand this one? If you see that, I will show you some of the data. If you see that, whatever the rates are coming down for the RBI purpose, it is the lowest all time. The repo rate has come at 5.15% is the lowest all time. But still, the demand is not created in the hands of the people. This is a story I will discuss later. So in this way what happens is that your economic growth will be enhanced for a period of time. The final is that to see that your foreign, foreign exchange stability is in the control. So whenever rupee will appreciate, why we bother? Whenever the rupee will appreciate, why we should bother? Okay? Whenever the rupee appreciate, why we should bother? Export gets. Why we, we are not exporting country, no? If the export is advantage for the rupee, it appreciates. It becomes a costly. But one more thing is that we are importing countries. We are importing countries. Only thing, you know, rupee should not depreciate basically. If you are importing country, rupee should not depreciate in terms of a dollar. As a depreciating in, ter in terms of a dollar, we should give more money to the international market. As a result, what happens? Our trade efficiency will increases further. So as a result, it's a burden on the economy. That's why whenever there is a some kind of a depreciation happens or whatever the things happens, the government RB will come into the picture. They increase the tariff on the gold import. We cannot control the crude oil, but they increase the tariff on the gold import. They stop the getting the gold because we pay more money for the gold. So as a result, they try to see that all the other way is that we sell the dollar in the international market. Whatever we have a reserves in the, with the dollar reserves, we sell artificial, we create a demand for our money and we avoid demand for the dollar currency. By selling the currency in the international market, what happens? Automatically we are buying our currency from the international market. As a result, we are trying to appreciate our currency. If we depreciate more, we pay more. That's why exchange rate stability is also one of the important objective of the, the RBI, where it can see that all these objectives are fulfilled from time to time. This is what I have discussed. I will not go further into this one. Yeah, this one. As for the uh, checker of the committee, they said that what should be your inflation in your economy? They said that 4 to 6 percent, plus or minus uh, 2 is acceptable. But if it is crosses the 6 percent, then it is a problem for your economy. You see that, it should be under the control. That's why whenever you read the papers, whenever they say that your inflation is a 3.36 percentage, your retail inflation is much. Because of that one, we are reducing our effort. If it is crosses higher, means the inflation is increasing. The more money is available in the hands of the people, the more spending activities happening in the hands of the people, then how to control that spending? So what we do is that we increase our the repo rate. As we increase our repo rate, automatically the lending activity will come because the rate of interest will go up in the market. As a result, the investor will not willing to take a loans from the banks. So this is where that's what we discuss in terms of the instruments. These are the different instruments of the monetary policies. So what is the repo? The reverse repo, liquidity adjustment facilities and marginal standing facilities, bank rate, cash to ratio, SLR, open market operation. These are the different instruments which are the part of the monetary policy. But among this one, Repo rate became the important policy variable for a change in your market rate. Earlier it was like your CRR, SLR used to be your bank rate used to be the important policy variable but after regular margin came to the, uh, as a RBA governor he made it, a repo rate as an important policy variable where the rate of rates will change on the basis of your, your repo rate. So we'll go, what is this first repo rate? Basically, the simple thing is the report is rate at which the RBI lends to the commercial banks in India. 
repo rate is the rate at which RBI lends overnight liquidity to the commercial banks in India. What is the uh, today's rate is 5.15 percent rate, which is at the lowest all time now. So this is the rate which the commercial banks borrows from the RBI for the overnight liquidity uh, shortages or whatever it is. So if RBI, when the report rate becomes cheap, if the report rate becomes costly, how does it impact on your economy? That's the most important thing here is that. The one thing is that if repo rate goes up, if, repo, if today is 5.9 per it may get 7%. How does it impact on your economy? If repo rate comes down, how does it impact on your economy? That's the most important thing why you want this. One is that if the repo rate goes up, if today is 5.9 per we assume that it goes to 7% or 8%. How does it impact your economy? The first thing is that, what is our definition? The repo rate is the rate at which the commercial banks borrows from RBI overnight liquidity. If I borrow from that bank, what is the, what is the today market for housing loan? It's around 8.45% to 9.45% or 10%. But if this goes to 7%, does the rate remain the same? No, they will increase your the housing loan mode, uh, whatever we have, the other motor is whatever that loans are increases. So what happens is that as loan rate goes up in the market, the investors are not willing to take loan at that point of time because the rates are very high in the market. So what happens automatically, the investment will come down in the market. As investment will come down in the market, the production activity will also stop for the a short period of time. As a result, overall what happens is that we are observing the liquidity from the market. Why we are doing? Because the inflation is very high in the market. The spending activity is very high in the market. We want to control that one. We want to the control, we want to observe whatever the liquidity available in the market. So if I increase the rate of interest, the banks will find difficult to lend. As your repo rate goes up, your reverse repo rate will also go. So then what the banks will do is that better to keep it the RBI rate, I get it, a better interest rate than the lending activities. Repo rate is the rate at which the commercial banks borrow from the RBI. The reverse repo rate is which RBI borrows from the commercial banks at the rate which is mentioned by the RBI. So now the banks will find better is that to keep money with the RBI rather than lending because if they lend there is a chance of default, MPA, blah 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 things will happen. So as a result what a bank will suffer. So because of that one, whenever the inflation is very high in the market, RBI will increase the inflation, to RBI will increase the repo rate to control lending activity of the banks. As a result what happens? We are observing the liquidity from the or we are controlling the liquidity flow to the market. If the inflation is under the control, we are releasing the more liquidity to the market, we are reducing the interest rate where the more lending activity can be created, where more investment activity can be created because to create a demand in the system. Why if you read the papers, why they are decreasing the repo rate? Because they want to create a demand for the loans. The lending activity should take place more. The investment activity should take place more. As a result, your economic development will be created. There is a demand is created in the system, which can automatically, the economic growth can happen. But unluckily, this time, because of the decrease in report, is not influencing your demand. There's a huge demand, huge debate is going on economic forum that whatever the policies which are present government is taking up, it is not able to create a demand. This is the biggest challenge for the present government that one side there is a debate is going on that whatever the growth, your GDP growth you are showing it is a manipulated growth. Other side you are showing that the employment rate has increased. Again there is a leakage in that one also. Now the point is that there is a bigger talk is that a growth with unemployment. How sustainable is that one? A growth with unemployment. You are projecting higher growth, but unemployment rate is increasing. You are decreasing all your policy rates, but no lending activity is happening. There is no confidence on the banking system now. People are trying to remove their money from the bank. They are more believing in the real estate than the banks. If they have one house, they are buying three houses, because banks will be loan. 
This is the present situation is a very complicated situation for Indian economy. Where one side unemployment is, in, you can see that from last couple of months, many big big firms are layoff, layoff in their employees. Means there is no demand in the system. How do you create the demand is the most important task for the, the present one. So this is where the report plays a very crucial role whenever there is a high inflation, low inflation. How does this report can be used to, to control that inflation in the system? So this is the reverse report rate when I saw that. This is the rate which the commercial banks lends to the RBI. So this is 4.959 percentage. Your report rate is at 5 point. Actually when it started, it was like one point difference. If it is a 5.15 percentage as per the policy what they, but now the gap has reduced because the bank, uh, the RBI started to suffer because one percent is a huge difference. Whenever the inflation is high, if I take more, what are the surplus liquidity available with the bank, if I observe that liquidity, I should pay more interest to the banks. The banks were finding that was a uh, heavenly place for them. Rather than lending, it's a better place to have a guaranteed return on that investment. So as a result, what happened is that the gap has come down now. It's only 25 basis points now. <coughs> so here, it's like where the commercial banks will keep their funds with the uh, uh, RBI. That's what I was telling that when there's too much fund is available with the banks, the RBI will observe that more fund from the bank because they should not involve in the, the lending equipment. When this happens, is that when there's a, the high inflation in the system. When there's a high inflation in the system, whatever the surplus liquidity, for example, like SDFC has a surplus liquidity, they can use for lending activity. But RBI will observe the liquidity under the, the reverse reported way. We stop lending activity business because we want to observe the liquidity whatever the available in the market. We should not accelerate more inflation in the system by lending more activity, more money available in the market. There is a concept called too much money chasing the two free goods. Too much money chasing the two free goods means we have only 10 product. 10 product but there is 20 demands are there. What happens? What do you think the prices will go? Yesterday I was telling that 10 quintal coin, of rice is required for Hyderabad. Fine, 10 quintal 10, 10, 10 and 10 people are demanding whatever that is equal, supply and demand equal. But if demand increases, supply remains constant, price will go up automatically. So what happened? Too much money chasing too few goods. Too much money chasing too few goods. That's why why we remove uh, top concept of inflation is because the goods and services, demand and supply is not equal in the system. When the demand and supply is not equal in the system, what happens is that automatically the prices will go up in the economy. That's why from time to time we always bother about the inflation in the system. Because we are not producing that much goods and services. For example, today only is 70, 75 rupees kijo. Why? There's a lack of supply from the market. So this is the reason where we can see that because of this one, whenever there is a high inflation in the system, they try to observe the liquidity from the, the market. So this is uh, liquidity adjustment facilities that whenever there is a mismatch between the banking in terms of their uh, uh, whatever liquidity available, they use both this repo and the reverse repo rate to adjust the mismatch between them, whatever we have uh, liquidity in the adjusting the mismatch with them, that's why the repo and reverse repo are the operation of your LF. Where we use this liquidity adjustment facility to see that there should not be a mismatch between the liquidity whatever is available in the, the bank. And this is one more additional facilities which is provided for the, the bankers that whenever under the repo you can uh, take this much loan from the RBA. But if you want an additional loan from the bank, uh, RBA, then what is the process? So under that category, you can take additional loan under the category of your marginal, the standing facility where the scheduled commercial bank borrow the additional amount of overweight money from the reserve bank by dipping into their SLR, the statutory liquidity ratio where the bank will be holding with themselves which is a 18.5 percentage which the bank will be holding in the form of asset in the form of bonds in the form of currencies in that you can dip of your 
percent of your net asset and liability at a penal rate of interest, not at the repo rate what is providing, but it's additional rate of interest where if you have required more money, there you can dip into your SLR and you can take a two percent of your total net asset and liability and use for the lending activity. So that's why we this is used only for unanticipated liquidity shock arises. Because when there is no liquidity available, then they want to dip into their own SLR way, they can take money from to overcome liquidity shock. This is the purpose way our marginal standing facilities are used. So this is a 5.4 percentage where it is equal to, it is higher than your repo rate. That's what P the rate of interest we call it as. If you want to take your money from the uh, SLR, you want to pay higher interest rate on that money. That's what our rate of interest is, 5.4 percent. That is the current rate of interest. Again here, uh, if there is a, actually the bank rate and repo rate are always confused. Actually, initially the bank rate was the one instrument which used to be lending activity, but now after the introduction of a repo and a bank, what the major difference is that repo rate is for the short term period, where 1 days to 90 days something is there, and the bank rate is for the a long term rate, where they, uh, for the repo rate we should have a collateral securities, but, but for the bank rate we not require a collateral securities of this thing. I have a small difference. Okay. Okay, the difference between the bank rate and collateral is that no collateral is involved in a bank rate. But a repurchase agreement is used, that is what, by if you take this much loan, by this time I will repay whatever the loan I have taken, that is what I will come back. Repurchase. So, what is the duration? And a repo rate is to lend money short term, more than the two days to up to 90 days, whereas in the bank rate it is a longer than the, more than the 90 days to up to one year. So, where this duration will tell the difference between your the bank rate and the repo rate. So, this is where I can uh, your uh, repo rate and reverse repo rate. So, you can see that it was around 8 percentage uh, in between 2012 and again here 7 or 8 percentage up to 2014. But after 2015, you can see that your repo rate is coming drastically down. This is October 2019 data. It is coming uh, drastically down. And here also, when the inflation was very low, they tried to reduce your see your repo rate because to create a more demand. Rate. So as you can see that we are assuming that after 2009, this is the first time you can see that your repo rates are coming all time low because this why because we are saying that the inflation is under control. We want to create a more demand in the system. We want to create a more investment, a more lending activity where it can take up the investment activity where it can lead to the production also. So this is the logic behind what we are doing in the system by reducing your the policy rates. This is the cash reserve ratio. This is the a daily average of 4% of your reserve should be kept with the RPI. 4% of your net asset and liability should be kept with RBI. Why? Because of the any liquidity shock or a, it's a cushion for you or any kind of a mishappens in your buckets. For example, today there are more depositors are there. What they do is that if they, anything goes wrong, they can use this CRM money has to support in the more a depositor. That's why it is today, 4% of your, of your net asset and liability should be kept with the RBI as a reserve. That's what, what are the uh, amount of your uh, net asset liability, the 4% of the net asset, asset liability will be should be with the, the RBI. <coughs> this is a, one more, the side liquidity ratio I was telling you that earlier we used to, whenever we used to control the inflation in the system, what we used to do is that the CRR, SLR, bank rate, these three are a very important instrument to control inflation or, or inject the liquidity in the market, observe the liquidity or inject the liquidity in the market. But earlier it was this instrument, what earlier in 1991 it was by including both SLR and CRR it was around 52 percentage. 52 percentage of your net asset and liability was under the reserves. Means the banks were not allowed to spend that 52 percent for lending activity. Whatever the, 40, the remaining 48 percent of your net asset and is only allowed to for the lending activity. 
Because of that, what happens? The bank has to suffer a lot. Whatever I have a reserve, if it, whatever I have asset, if it goes in the reserve, you know, how to do a business? As the Simon Committee said that you should bring down your SLR and CRR. Now the SLR is 18.5%. It was around uh, 22, uh, 20 something more. It was around something. Now it is 18.5%. And your CRR is around. 4%. So it is around 22.5 percentage is your now reserves. Uh, compared to 1981, it is 52. Now it is 22%. Now the rest of the money you can use for the lending activity purposes. So SLR is one more instrument. Whenever we want to inject the liquidity, what we do is that we reduce it. By reducing what we are doing, the more liquidity is available to the bank to lend. Whenever there is an inflation is very high, we increase. SLR, we increase CRR, we increase the policy report. So what happens, we are observing that we are cutting down the liquidity for the lending purposes. This is where we try to see that the monetary policy see that more inflation cannot be created in the system. Or we want to inject the liquidity to create a more demand, reduce all the rates. If you want to control inflation, increase all the rates automatically the lending activity will come down. So this is one more way the static liquid ratio is used with the bank itself. Many people when they write, they make a mistake that CRR will be with the bank, SLR will be with the RBI. No, the CRR will be with the RBI, SLR will be with them only under the different formula of like the government securities, the cash and gold and other uh, government securities will be under the SLR categories. So this is where they keep with themselves 18.5% of their net asset and liabilities. And as this we saw that these are the instruments which are used by the monetary policy. Open market operation is that where the government tells that to the RBA, sell my securities in the market. Sell my bonds in the market. Why? To observe the liquidity. When there is a high inflation in the system, the more liquidity is available among the investors. Who are the investors? Institutional investors, retail investors, all these investors are there. When the government sells their security to these investors, the money is flowing to the RBA. So whatever the money they had with the investors, it is observed by the RBA in the form of open market operation. Where in the open market operation, the RBA is selling the government security securities behalf of the government. So as a result, one side RBI instruments are playing, other side open market instruments are playing way to observe the excess of liquidity or release the liquidity to the market to see that the demand is created or demand is controlled in the system. This is where when you see that there is excess flow of capital into the system. How do we protect that capital? So under the new market suggestion scheme, under the in 2004, they, they bought the scheme to control the excess liquidity in the system and that whatever the liquidity is available in the system, it becomes a separate government account with the reserve bank account. The cash mobilized through this account, it will be under the separate government account under the RBI where they observe this excess liquidity through FDI investment or other investment, whatever the money flows, they put it in the, under the category of separate account under the market stabilization schemes. That's so what the surplus liquidity of more uh, arising from the large capital inflows is observed through sale of short term rated government securities and whatever the money we get, we keep it in a separate account of the RBI. So these are the, how does we uh, control the credit by the reserve bank. These are the four different uh, steps. We use a repo rate policy, open market operation, the cash reserve ratio, and standard. Now you should explain me that whenever you write exam, how does the repo rate will influence your inflation and deflation? How the open market will help in controlling inflation and deflation? Cash reserve ratio, how does it help in controlling inflation? Or Inject, or we can tell inject, injecting the liquidity, observing the liquidity. Okay, so these are the few things. How does this individual uh, rates or instruments plays a crucial role in terms of controlling your or fulfilling the objective of price stability, economic growth, and foreign exchange stability? How does this four instrument play a crucial role in terms of? Uh, your price stability. This is where uh, you should explain and if you get this question. Anything to ask? You, know, you should ask now. 
Questo che è la solution element. How does the open market operation look? I want to inject a liquidity. They have to perform your hard exam. They have to tomorrow, no? My paper? Yeah, tell me. How does open market operation helps to inject liquidity? What is open market operation? Open market operation is a simple thing is where the RBI sells the government securities or purchases the government securities from the market. How does that selling and purchasing will impact your economy or injecting a liquidity or observing a liquidity from the market? This is a question which you should understand. The first thing is that whenever there is a more liquidity flowing in the system, I want to observe that liquidity from the market because it is because of that liquidity which is flowing in the system is creating a more inflation in the system. The goods are few but money is chasing more. So how does I do control that one? One thing is that by selling my government securities, when I sell that government securities invest different kind of investors, they want to pay me money. So by through what happened, I am observing the liquidity. If I sell something, they should give me money. So that is a compulsory requirement where we sell the securities, the people will buy because they know that the market conditions are not good. Market conditions are not good. We cannot find a higher rate of return, return in any way compared to this government securities. So what do they do? They keep all their money in the, the government securities. So as a result, we observe the liquidity from the, the market. But suddenly, economic conditions are good. Again, we sell them. That is what repurchase agreement. We sell them again at a rate of interest. If it is a 5.7 percentage, if I take a 10 rupees, I give him a 15.7 rupees in the, on the repurchase agreement date. So what happens as a result of that one, again I am injecting liquidity in the market by buying back my securities. This is where to observe liquidity in the market. To control the lending activity, we use a repo rate, we use a CRR, we use a SLR. As the repo rate goes up, the interest rate of your other things, will, lending rate of interest will go up. As the lending rate is interest goes up, what happens? People will not borrow loans. They will postpone their the borrowing activity. They postpone their investment activity. As they postpone investment activity, if some companies plan to expand their market, if suddenly the interest rate is going very high, they postpone their the investment activity because the loans will be very costly. So as a result of what happens, it will impact your economy. Other activities also will stop. Now if I want to expand some market in some area, I want people to work over there. As I want more people to work over there, that everything will be stopped for the, a certain period of time. Because inflation is very high. Again, second one, the CRR is there. This is the reserve ratio which the bank will keep with the RBA. So now the CRR increases, then the bank should give from their net asset liability to the RBI. If you go 6 percentage, the 2 percent of the net asset liability should be given to the RBI. Again what happens? The money flow to the RBI chest. Again SLR, 18.5 percentage, they make it 20 percentage. So whatever I have other things, I should put it into here my... So in overall, whenever we want to have a control inflation, we them in all the direction that the money should not flow to the system. You want to observe as much as liquidity for the market to see that the spending activity is controlled. There's the biggest debate is happening the monetary transmission. Whatever the policy rates reduced by the RBI, it is not going to the customers. Today 5.15 percent is the rate, but what is our lending interest rate today is still 8.45. Is on 3.4 percent. Does that whatever the monetary policy benefits are given by RBI is transferred to the customers? No. So that's why our, our regular margin fought for this one, but he failed in doing this one because 
that cannot happen because bankers have their own policy of changing the interest rate on the basis of the previous record, whatever they have accumulation stock, blah blah blah, many things happen. For every three months or six months, they sit a board meeting will sit. In the board meeting, they, they should decide that whether to reduce or not to reduce. In this way, these are the things that how to control a credit in the system. In the context of your economic structure, economic environment. Your economic environment is good, this will all will be positive. Means positive means rates will be less. If the economic condition is bad, this will be higher rates will be there in the market. This is where the monetary policy plays a crucial role in terms of controlling your system through price stability. You get my point? Okay, we'll stop here. Take a break. 10.15 now, or 10.30? 10.30 now, you take a break. We'll start here. Okay. The fiscal policy will be able to fulfill its objective of your... These are the few objectives. How does it try to fulfill its objectives? One is that the full employment. What do you mean by full employment? Whoever is willing to work, we provide him a job. Where not a person is willing to work, but there is no job. We call it as a not full employment. So now the point is the full employment. How do I create a full employment in the system? Is the most important thing for the government. I told you example of Kia. In that locality, we are, now, we are able to provide a lack of employment opportunity. In this locality, in financial districts, we are able to provide a lack of employment. Like this, the fresh industries, big, big industry comes to your country. By coming to the industry, organized employment, unorganized employment is indirectly created in the system. So organized employment is like registered companies will come there, they will provide employment. Unorganized is like we have a glitch shop, we have a tea shops. These are unorganized sectors which is more dominant in your sector. So what happens? Both unorganized and organized sectors will grow as a result of your the fresh investment or industry coming to your country. As a result, if the more industry comes to your country, you have more employment opportunity. If you are able to achieve the concept of your full employment, other aspects will be easily taken care. Okay, other aspect is taken care in the certain condition. When the demand is increasing the system, at the same time supply should also increase. There is a talk that population is growing, but we are not able to fulfill the whatever the population is required. We are not able to fulfill the basic requirement of your population. It means that the other side, the demand is increasing for your goods and services. But other side, the supply is not increasing at the same rate what the population is increasing demand. So there is imbalance. So when there is imbalance, only the top problem starts. So your supply and the demand should go together. So again I told you that economic stability. Other side, other side we talk monetary policy, how it uses its economic stability. Other side also, the government will see that the excess money is not flown into the system. How? We call the concept of deficit. Is it? What is the deficit? Is like revenue minus expenditure is your deficit. Then the point is that Many economists say that deficit is a good for your country. Why? Because for the 2019 budget, I project my my budget is around 10,000 crores. I project on the basis of whatever the revenue sources for me. I plan for my 2019 and 20. My estimation budget for the 2019 is 10,000 crores for the small economy. But when I come to the 2020 March, my revenue was only 8,000 crores. The revenue was 8,000 crores, but estimated budget was 10,000 10, crores. This 2,000 crores, where do I get? This is the biggest question for them. So earlier what they used to do is that whenever there was a deficit, the government will used to tell to the RBA that print more currency. The print more currency, but you cannot do like that. By printing more currency, what you are indirectly doing is that you are decreasing the value of your money in the system. Some people say, as per this is my economy, as per my will and wish, I can print my currency. But that 
cannot happen because you can print more currency but other side the goods and services should also be more when you have more money and chasing only few goods automatically inflation will go in the economy it's in the system for the venezuela they have around 400 500 percent inflation libya they have high inflation they are printing the currency as much as we will and wish. At the same time, other side also should be there, supply should also be there. They are taking their currency in the trolley and they are getting in a bag in a of our goods in a bag, small bags. What do you understand by this concept? You understand that the value of your currency is very low where the currency's purchasing power is very low. I was telling another example, if my grandmother used to go to the market used to pay 100 rupees one week, sufficient vegetables. But today, even if you take more money, the money is with the people. But, there is a less goods are available in the market. As you are open, automatically the price of your goods are increasing. The purchasing power of your currency is coming down. As your purchasing power of your currency is coming down, your economy is in it. Decision. The poor will be getting affected by this one. The poverty will increase us. If you get your 10 rupees breakfast, fine. But if the same breakfast become 100 rupees, the person who is earning a 50 rupees per day, how do he do? spend his income? This is problematic. That's why the currency value should be very high in the system. As a result, a country cannot print your currency according to your will and wish. If you print your currency upon the will and wish, then you are creating a problem for your economy. So at the same time, what happens is that to fulfill the deficit, the government used to tell the RB that to print more currency, I want this much currency money for to fill that deficit. So as a result, what happened? It is to affect your economy. But now, under the certain acts, the RB said that we cannot print or the government is not able to take this much money from the RB. So you want to decide your own way. What is the other way? What is the borrowing from the international market? Selling the government securities in the international market. Or the present is disinvestment. You can read the budget report. By disinvestment, I am getting 10 lakh crores. Selling our Indian airlines or selling our public sector units. Means we are taking up our money from these public sector students. So as a result of that, what it is that we are taking up all our share from the public sector we are putting into the budget to fill that deficient. So as a result of way we see that, we want to see that ultimate objective is to see that how to stabilize the rate of economies. If you achieve this one, full employment, at the same time the production supply is taken care, automatically the rate of growth will increase in your system. And again, this one, the rate of capital formation and the investment. Earlier, we used to depend upon our household savings much. But today, one of the important capital formation in India was household savings. But today, the household savings are coming down. It is already the source of capital formation. That's why we are giving more liberty for the foreign direct investment. FIIs are coming to your country. FDIs are coming to you because we require more capital for the development activity. We require the big, big industry to come to your country to fulfill the objective of your full employment. So these are the things which other side, the monetary place, policy plays its objective. Other side, the objective of monetary physical policy to see that the ultimate objective is that your economic stability, economic growth. So this is where uh, we can see that uh, your objectives are fulfilled. This is uh, not required much. What I will discuss it is there in the PPT space. That's what I was telling that uh, raising the ratio of savings in terms of the capital formation and uh, rate of investment, encouraging the, uh, the flow of spending to the productive sectors. That's what if any FDA comes, we try to see that it should come to the industries. Why? It created a lot of opportunities. Not only employment opportunity, but other opportunities also created surrounding that area. So that will impact your economy. That's where it plays a very crucial place. And ultimate objective is that reducing the inequalities of income and the wealth. 
But if that, but what is happening here today? Because of the globalization, the rich are becoming richer, the poor are becoming poor. The inequality is bulging. If the inequality is bulging further, where does it lead? This is an important question. Does it lead to some kind of a new revolution or some kind of new things, or a civil war kind of a things? Don't know. Which is in coming days it will be known if 20 percent. Of the 20 people are holding 80 percent of asset, and another 80 percent of the population holding 20 percent of asset. It's a huge new point. So this is where it's very important to see that the ultimate objective of your government is to see that inequality should be come down. The poverty level should come down in your system. To do that one, economic growth is one of the important instruments to achieve the lower the poverty of your country. Another important topic, inflation and <coughs> is it? Yeah, a general rise in the price or the persistence rise in the price over a period of time. Means your prices are drastically increasing or increasing at a higher rates. This will create a problem. That's what. What are the different types of inflation? Though? That's what. Uh, this is. Uh, that's what. The inflation is defined as the persistence the rise in your average level of prices in the economy. In India, we uh, we measure in terms of a consumer price index. But before. Uh, Rajan, we used to use the wholesale price index. There is a huge debate took place that why we should go for wholesale price index rather than we can go for the consumer price index. Now, the indicator to measure your inflation is the consumer price index. Say the consumer price index. What are the uh, indicators which we take for a consideration to measure the inflation? One is that the food, beverages, and tobacco, the fuels and light, housing, clothing, and business. But earlier, we used to take the wholesale uh, index rates to count. But now, we want to see that from the consumer point of time, what is the purchasing, is actual purchasing power uh, among these categories. This is fine. So, uh, here two things are there. How does your inflation is cost. One is the demand pull inflation, other is the cost push inflation. Is there? The rate is there inside? Okay, fine. So basically when we talk about demand and pull inflation, the demand and pull inflation is cost where the aggregate demand is higher than your aggregate supply, exceeds your aggregate supply. Aggregate demand exceeds your aggregate supply. We call it as a demand pull inflation. Then aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply. We call it as a demand pull inflation. Okay, what are this component of your uh, aggregate demand? The components of aggregate demand are your consumption, investment, public expenditure, and exports. These are the component of your, we call it as a C plus, I plus, G plus, uh, X minus 7. So this is your, C is your consumption, investment, expenditure, uh, government expenditure plus export minus import. We call it as a, the component of your aggregate demand. Among this, any of your component increases, then the supply, then there is a push in your, yesterday I was discussing that, how the supply is a constant, demand was pushed up. As demand was pushed up, automatically what happened? The prices went up. It is because of excess demand was created in the system, then the supply 
automatically the prices were they gone up in the system. That's why, because it, now the consumption, you can get a consumption and the price. Actual consumption of your, this locality is 10 dollars tomatoes. Fine, if 10 quintal of tomato is required, fine. But if the consumption of your tomato increases to 15 quintal of tomatoes, the supply is 10 quintal. The 5 quintal is extra. But what happens? Automatically, too much money is chasing too few goods. So what happens is that we require additional consumption. Now what happens is that whoever is having more money, they take up the more product. The lesser money people will postpone. The people used to have a two tomato, three or four tomatoes, they come to one tomatoes. You know, there's a reason there was a situation where the onion was not available in the system. If you go to the even biryani shop also, they stop giving onion also. Why? There was lack of supply in the system. Then we begged the Pakistani people to import the onions. To fulfill the supply constraint in the world. Because of that one, the demand is more, but supply is less. Automatically, what? the prices are increased in the system. So what happened is that, because of that one, it will put a lot of pressure on your demand side. When supply is less, the demand is more, it will put a pressure on the price to increase in the system. That's what, too much money chasing too few goods. This simple example you can tell us. Yesterday we are telling, this is our aggregate supply, this is aggregate supply. The initial equilibrium point is at when the price was P1 and the Y1 was This is our national output and this is price level. But as the demand increases, sudden demand increases, the supply is constant. Yes, after some mechanism, we try to see that fulfill the supply. But sudden increase in your demand, what has it led? It has led to the increase in your prices. So what happened? The demand pull inflation is because of the increase in the components. Because supply is constant. Demand increased. As the demand increased, automatically the prices were increased in the system. That's why we call it demand pull inflation. And what are the factors which affects in reality, in real economy to see that it affects your demand. One is that increase in the money supply. <coughs> One of the factors is that increase in the money supply. I was telling that whenever there is a deficit in the system, if you print more money, then more money is flowing to the system. As more money is flowing to the system, then what happens is that too much money is with the people, but less goods are available in the system. So demand for goods is more. Because if I have more money, I'll sit idle. Yeah. I will not sit idle. If suddenly your income is 1 lakh, it becomes 10 lakhs. You buy whatever you have a wild desire, all the product you buy. But other side there should be supply also. If the supply is not there, then automatically even there's one product is available in some shop, you'll go that you'll bargain that you should get that product. Same thing happens in the market also. When the lack of supply is there in the market, the people will fall to get that price at higher auction. In the right to bazaar, if you go that, the product will come, they will put for the auction. Whoever quote higher price, it will go for them. In Kerala, liquor shop, when the liquor shop opens morning, there is a big line in front of a liquor shop. Why? Because there is less shops in the, the Kerala. If the shops increase, supply increase, then automatically the line in front of the government shop will come down. Yes or no? But in Hyderabad we don't have a problem. In Gali Gali we have two, three uh, liquor shops. Even the three, three liquor shops, again the queue will be there. So, so much demand. But supply is also there. Okay? So, the way we can see that, when we see that, the money is more with us people, but the supply is less, supply of the goods is less. Then we try to extract by giving higher price to get that particular product. Why we are not going to the government hospital? Whoever is having money, they go to the private hospital. Whoever having less money, they go to the government. In government also there is no bid. 
Every day we see some issue in the government hospitals. The population is very high, but demand is very low. So supply is very less. Demand is very high, but supply is very less. So whenever there is an increase in the money supply in the system, more than what it required, we see that it will lead to the demand pull inflation in the system. Increase in the public expenditure. For example, my present budget is 10,000 crores for the Hyderabad. I'll make it 20,000 crores. 10,000 crores increased. Now, this money is for what? A spending purposes to start a new project, to start a new uh, industry. When I start this new industry, the government is pushing more money into the system. This, whenever they push more money into the system, what they are doing is that they are trying to provide wages to the people, income to the people. As they get income to the people, then what happens? The demand for goods and services. Increasing your the public expenditure, it creates a demand for inflation system. So that's why where your supply is constant, your demand is pushing up because of your increase in money supply, increase in the public expenditure, it creates a demand for inflation in the system. Disposable income. As your income increases, your disposable income increases, your demand, the more the goods and services in the system. Consumer spending. We, we, we heard that the Western people are more spending uh, people than the Indian. We are more saving kind of a people. But Western people are more spending people. So what happens is that even if your income has increased, if you save a lot of money in terms of uh, savings, then automatically your spending activity will come down. But if you are like a Western country, if I get a one lakh, I spend one lakh, then again there is more demand for your goods and services in the system. The spending activity or activity of your country will also influence your the demand pull inflation in the system. Cheap multiples, that's what I You cannot print as per your will and wish your currencies. If you have a cheap monetary policy, you are creating a demand pull inflation in the system. Deficit financing, I told you. What is deficit financing? Deficit is a revenue minus expenditure. How do you finance? I finance by borrowing, printing currency, or a disinvestment pattern. So this all of what we are doing is that we are injecting a more liquidity into the system. Luckily we have corruption more, that's why we are less bothered. <laughs> and the black money. How does the black money? Huh? Sorry? No, yeah, I know that, but how does your black money will create demand for inflation? Cannot be spent. Cannot be put out in the market. Anything else, Vijay? How does this black money can create a demand? Yeah, I'm not putting money to spend, so I'll be fine. When do they spend? Who are this major black money holders? Industries. Politicians. Politicians. We assume that politicians are the major black money holders. When does this black money will come into the, uh, black money will uh, flow out of the, their hands during the election? During the election. The person who is used to get a wages of 100 rupees or 200 rupees per day in a village, if he suddenly gets a thousand rupees per vote for a day, if the five people are there, 5,000 from one party. If some other party will give 2,000 rupees, 10,000. If like that, if two, three parties are fighting in that locality, what happens to his income? <laughs> Automatically, the income of the people will be increased. <coughs> then the income increases, does they become idle? No, that's why we always fear that the black money can create a parallel economy in the system. That's so why we are behind the black money to control this kind of activity. But luckily today we have this black money is coming through Mauritius into India in terms of a white money. Mauritius is a heaven for the investors. No tax free. We have made Mauritius as tax free because we know that our money is going the outside and coming through Mauritius. Again what is happening? The extra burden on the economy because the money is flowing to the system. 
the extra money is flowing the system. As a result, what happens is that in the short run, because of this extra money is flowing the system, excess demand is created. Again, in that period of time, your demand will be pushed up. Earlier, for a normal household, 2,000, 3,000 was expenses. So, only if you have 20,000, 25,000, you demand for TV, you demand for cycle, you demand for everything. Nowadays, they have a best example, they give the gold ring. In some constituency, they give the gold ring or gold coins. So, this is where you can see that these are the factors which affect your the demand for inflation. You can see that how money supply is increasing over a period of time. After 2013, uh, see how the money supply has increased in your system from time to time. These are three different things that there. One is uh, reserve money, narrow money, and the broad money. Broad money is a composed of M1 plus M2. M1 means you are, uh, this is what inflation we have. Okay, I'll show you that. M1 is like uh, the currency with the public, post office saving, all these things. And again, if, if you come to broader money, the bank, order the deposit to the banks, post office, currency with the public, circulation of currency, all these included, that is what you are, the broad money. So this is where it is a very high in the system. You can understand that if the money supply is such a high, automatically you should bother about inflation. So this is what second is the cost push. Inflation is a result of increase in the, the cost of the production. <coughs> the major source of the cost push inflation is your supply shock. Supply shocks can be happen due to following reason. One is that abrupt increase in cost of production. It may be many factors why the cost of production can be increased. Raw material prices goes up, transportation cost will go up. Because of that one, automatically the firm or a company don't have others source rather than increasing the price. So what happens is because of the cost push inflation, cost push where inflation is increasing in the system. So what happens is the aggregate supply is higher than the aggregate, uh, aggregate supply is lesser than aggregate demand. When demand is more, supply is less automatically, your prices will go up in the system. So this is a simple thing is that our actual was the P1 was our economy where our agreed demand was Y1 in the economy. But as because of increase in our raw material cost of production, as the price goes up automatically, the production has shifted to the left side. When the production is shifted to the left side means automatically supply has come down. Automatically the supply has come down. As supply has come down Y down, actual demand was Y1. It has come down wide too. We can see that there is an increase in the, the price of your the goods and the services in the system. So this is where you can call as cost push inflation. The cost push inflation arises due to the increase in the raw material, the cost of production. Okay, first this is your actual where your where demand is equal to. Now what happened? You shifted to waste, shifted to the the left side. As it shifted left side means supply shortage, supply shock. For example, you remember this oil crisis happened in 1970. Suddenly the Iraq war was happening, oil was not available in the economy. Many countries were suffering. Automatically the prices were shoot up. Up to that time, the Keynesian economy was holding a control on the systems. Like where demand creates its own supply. Demand creates its own supply. Means if you have a demand in the system, automatically supply can be taken care of. But after 1970, when supply shock was created in the system, the many of the neoclassical economists, classical economists, they said that the supply also plays a very crucial role in the economy. See, we don't have supply of oil. How does it is impacting your economy? You are telling your demand, demand, demand. Now the demand is there, but supply is not there. 
Demand for your oil is there, but supply is not there. Automatically what happened? The prices went up very drastically higher. As a result, what happened? Your economy was in shutdown special. Because oil is the main a source of energy in your economy. When that is a cut down from your system, automatically the supply shock was created to your economy. As a result of that one, the many prices went up. Total prices in your system went up very high. That's where again the supply side economists regain their economic thinking that supply also plays a very crucial role. Earlier, if you have a demand, create a demand, automatically supply is taken care of. But after this 1970 incidents, they said that supply also plays a very crucial role. In this way, what happens is that here when supply shortage was created, I was telling another example. We like some product, but there is no product available in the market. You find somewhere that product, you go to the search and you get ready to give 10 rupees more to get the product. Means there is a supply shortage of the product. Because of the supply shortage, the prices are automatically going up in the system. So that's why as the supply shifted to banks world, you are automatically, the prices went up. This is where we call it as a cost push inflation. So, uh, we talk on this one. Okay, what are the major factors for your the cost push inflation? One is that the wage cost, the profit, import prices. The wages increases high, we demand more goods and services. If the goods and services are not available automatically, the prices will go up. But profit also. And if we have more profit, we have more demand for your goods and services. The last one is the import prices. Because crude oil, if crude oil prices goes up very high, import prices goes up very high when you have an importing country. India is basically importing country. When the crude oil prices goes up very high, automatically your prices will go up in your a domestic economy. As a result of that one, because of increase in the crude oil prices, other factors also get affected. As a result of that one, it is a cost push inflation in the system. That's a higher prices of commodity, oil price shock of 1973-70. Higher wages, higher food prices, this all are higher taxes. Okay, and related to this one, uh, recently there was some study by people, uh, by big, big economists, they said that why the food prices are increasing drastically in India. One is that continuous, you can see that uh, have continually by 7 out of 9 double digit inflation episode because of drought lent. Because there is a drastic supply of your goods and services in your country. Because uh, this year only we had it better than compared to a couple of years back. Because of no rain, all your bore wells, other, it is drying up. So where do you find a source of irrigation? Where do you find a uh, supply of your goods? Basic commodities are not supplied to the market. Automatically what happens is that it leads to the double digit inflations. So this is a few studies they said. Again, uh, there was, uh, we had a 7th pay commission. 7th K K commission, 5th pay commission was a central government employees. Sudden increase in the salaries by 20,000, 30,000. So what happened? With sudden increase by the salaries of the employees, automatically the excess demand was put in the system. But there was no supply. If other side there is a drought, other there is no supply of the basic commodity in the system, but other side your income is growing. Then you demand the more goods and services. That's why we are importing all the. I never heard. Uh, what is this? I call dengu food. This is a, what is this food? Red color, dragon food. I call dengu food that one because it's more good for the dengu uh, patient. It has a more use. So this uh, dragon food, I never saw. Nowadays we are importing that one. Kiwi. Again, uh, bay some other foods. All of these are not a domestic market goods, but we are importing all the basic commodity because there is other side. There's a demand for this product. Whatever the price is, we are buying it. Hundred rupees they give two or three. The PS or the, the, the big food they give hundred rupees three or four. But we are ready to buy because income has increased in the country. Because of that one, what is happening is that we are importing more goods and services from the other country. As a result, our money is flowing to the other country. 
If the same thing is produced in your country, then everything is inside your country. You are more depending on your country for goods and services. So earlier we never imported wheat, but now we are importing wheat also. We destroyed the Punjab. Punjab was one of the big source of wheat supply. But today we don't have the supply of wheat from the states. What is happening? Today the farmers are moving towards the commercial crops than the normal crops. I had a data but I deleted it, I thought that it takes a lot of time. People are moving to the commercial crops. The cotton, which are the commercial way, they have more revenue. Because in a normal crop they find that there is no profit for them to cultivate. So in this way what happened is that over a period of time we are, our supply is coming down from time to time. When the supply is coming down from time to time, other side the income is increasing, the population is increasing, the demand is increasing for your basic commodity goods. Now how do you fulfill this match? How do you fulfill your gap? There is no only source of fulfilling the gap is importing the goods and services. When you import the goods and services automatically, the prices will be higher than the compared to what the basically the goods and services are available in your system. So in this way what happens is that there is a few things which we can see that this is what I like that what are the component of your money supply is that we, we take this one as a broad money supply for calculating your the money supply in the system. So M1 is the demand deposit with the banking system, other deposits with the RBA, less saving deposits with the post office. And here the reserve money which is uh, with the bank is that the currency in the circulation in the country and banker deposit with the RBI is that is what you are university for or CR or other things and the other deposits with the RBI. So when we merge M1, M2, M3, this is your broad money in the system which is considered as a calculating your money to supply. So M1 is this one, M2 uh, deposits come. So time deposit with the bank system, including all this one, we call it as a money supply for which it is circulated in your system. So, what are the major efforts we can look into the to uh, overcome the, the supply, the constant? What is the scrapped import duties on edible oil? To import more, there is a more demand for your goods and services. We should scrap import duties. Banned export on, see this is a way uh, export of basmati rice. I think we used to export more goods to the foreign country, but we stopped no more exports because there is a huge requirement for the best countries. Again, our pulses and other, we used to buy us export all the pulses and other things, but we told that no more export in the, this category. Why? Because domestically the supply will come down. It is it changes from time to time. Why we do this one is that to control the outflow of the goods from this country. For the seller, it is a profit for him to sell in the international market. But the same goods are available required for this domestic market. If the same goods are required for domestic market, then we should bring a policy that no more export of this commodity. Why we are doing this one? To see that demand is up to matches. By doing this one, we can bring down our cost push inflation in the system. This is a something about this. This is a recently uh, demand side factors. What are the factors which the demand side factors influence? One is that the peak I told you the peak commission of what? Automatically, the more income into the hands of the people, the more demand for the goods and services. Again, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, where we provide uh, 100 days of employment where the income is given to them, that is also creates your uh, more income among the people. Again, the fiscal deficit rising from years and transmissions. Okay, these are the few factors which are trying to see that the demand side factors are pushed. So how do we control this one? One thing is that creating a more supply, controlling, bringing over your physical deficit, controlling your money supply, no excess money or supply flow in the system. By doing this one, we can able to match your demand and supply. If you are not able to do that one, your economy, Indian economy is going to suffer a long term inflation problem in the system. So these are the demand side factors and 
supply side factors. Demand pull inflation is one of the factors, increase in the money supply, public expenditure, then disposable income, consumer spending activities, and cheap monetary policy. These are the few things which will inject more demand in the system. These are the important factors which contributes for your demand pull inflation. When it comes to the cost push inflation, your wages, import prices, and one more profits. These are the factors how it will allow people to spend more on the economic activities. So by doing that way, your economy is in the inflation. So one side is demand pull inflation, other side is the cost push inflation. So if I give, if you get this question in your exams, you should explain that how what is the demand pull inflation, what are the factors that affect the demand pull inflation, how can we reduce these factors, both the side. These three things should be demand side factors, cost side factors. By doing that one, you should you can explain your demand pull inflation and the cost push inflation. I'll need to ask here. <coughs> so this is a more important point. The physical uh, stimulus was provided to the because in 2008-9 crisis, we want to create a demand system. So we created a physical uh, stimulus package which is given to that one. But at the same time, there was a drought in the country. There is no much production in the country. So what happened is that income is more in the system, but supply is not there in the system. Automatically, it is a government created uh, kind of inflation in the system by uh, giving more stimulus package. So automatically, it led to the food uh, rise in the food prices in the mid 2009 period. So this is a two side demand side factors and the supply side factors are there which influence your uh, inflation in the system. Stop you Then again there is more demand for your goods and services in the system. The spending activity or activity of your country will also influence your the demand pull inflation in the system. Cheap monetary policy, that's what I You cannot print as per your will and wish your currencies. If you have a cheap monetary policy, you are creating a demand pull inflation in the system. Deficit financing, I told you. What is deficit financing? Deficit is the revenue minus expenditure. How do you finance? I finance by borrowing, printing currency, or a disinvestment pattern. So, this all of what we are doing is that we are injecting a more liquidity in the system. Luckily we have corruption more, that's why we are less bothered. <laughs> and the black money. How does the black money? Huh? Sorry? Money is just a, no, yeah, I know that, but how does the black money will create demand for inflation? Cannot be? Anything else, Vijay? How does this black money can create a demand? Yeah, I'm not putting money to spend, so I'll be fine. When do they spend? Who are these major black money holders? Industries. Politicians. Politicians. We assume that politicians are the major black money holders. When does this black money will come into the... Uh, black money will... Uh, flow out of the, their hands during the election. During the election. The person who is used to get a wages of 100 rupees or 200 rupees per day in a village, if he suddenly gets a 1000 rupees per vote for a day, if the 5 people are there, 5000 from one party, if some other party will give 2000 rupees, 10,000. If like that, if 2-3 parties are fighting in that locality, what happens to his income? Automatically, the income of the peoples will be increased. 
there and the income increases, does they become idle? No, that's why we always fear that the black money can create a parallel economy in the system. That's why we are behind the black money to control this kind of activity. But luckily today we have this black money is coming through Mauritius into India in terms of a white money. Mauritius is a heaven for the investors. No tax free. We have made Mauritius as tax free because we know that our money is going the outside and coming through Mauritius. Again, what is happening? The extra burden on the economy because the money is flowing to the system. The extra money is flowing to the system. As a result, what happens is that in the short run, because of this extra money is flowing to the system, excess demand is created. Again, the, that period of time, your demand will be pushed up. Earlier, for a normal household, 2,000, 3,000 was expenses. Suddenly, if you have 20,000, 25,000, you demand for TV, you demand for cycle, you demand for everything. Nowadays, they have a best example. They give the gold ring. In some constituency, they give the gold ring or gold coins. So this is where you can see that these are the factors which affects your the demand for inflation. You can see that how money supply is increasing over a period of time. After 2013, uh, see how the money supply has increased in your system from time to time. These are three different things that there. One is uh, reserve money, narrow money, and the broad money. Broad money is a composed of M1 plus M2. M1 means you are, uh, this is what inflation we have. Okay, I'll show you. M1 is like uh, the currency with the public, post office saving, all these things. And again, if you come to broader money, the bank, order the deposit to the banks, post office, currency with the public, circulation of currency, all this included, that is what you are, the broad money. So this is where it is a very high in the system. You can understand that if the money supply is such a high, automatically you should bother about inflation. So this is what second is the cost push. Inflation is a result of increase in the, the cost of the production. <coughs> the major source of the cost push inflation is your supply shock. Supply shocks can be happen due to following reason. One is that upward increase in cost of production. It may be many factors why the cost of production can be increased. Raw material prices goes up, transportation cost will go up. Because of that one automatically the firm or a company don't have others source rather than increasing the price. So what happens is because of the cost push inflation, cost push where inflation is increasing in the system. So what happens is the aggregate supply is higher than the aggregate, uh, aggregate supply is lesser than aggregate demand. When demand is more, supply is less automatically, your prices will go up in the system. So this is a simple thing is that our actual was the P1 was our economy, where our agreed demand was Y1 in the economy. But as because of increase in our raw material cost of production, as the price goes up automatically, the production has shifted to the left side. When the production is shifted to the left side means automatically supply has come down. Automatically the supply has come down. As supply has come down Y down, actual demand was Y1. It has come down Y2. We can see that there is an increase in the, the price of your the goods and the services in the system. So this is where you can call as cost push inflation. The cost push inflation arises due to the increase in the raw material, the cost of production. Okay, first this is your actual where your where demand is equal to. Now what happened? You shifted to waste, shifted to the the left side. As it shifted left side means supply shortage, supply shock. For example, you remember this oil crisis happened in 1970. Suddenly the Iraq war was happening, oil was not available in the economy. Many countries were suffering. Automatically the prices were shoot up. Up to that time, the Keynesian economy was holding a control on the systems. Like where demand creates its own supply. 
demand creates its own supply. Means if you have a demand in the system, automatically supply can be taken care of. But after 1970, when supply shock was created in the system, then many of the neoclassical economists, classical economists, they said that the supply also plays a very crucial role in the economy. See, we don't have supply of oil. How does it is impacting your economy? You are telling your demand, demand, demand. Now the demand is there, but supply is not there. Demand for your oil is there, but supply is not there. Automatically, what happened? The prices went up very drastically higher. As a result, what happened? Your economy was in a shutdown situation. Because oil is the main a source of energy in your economy. When that is a cut down from your system, automatically the supply shock was created to your economy. As a result of that one, the many prices went up. Total prices in your system went up very high. That's where again the supply side economies regain their economic thinking that supply also plays a very crucial role. Earlier, if you have a demand, create a demand, automatically supply is taken care of. But after this 1970 incidents, they said that supply also plays a very crucial role. In this way, what happens is that here when supply shortage was created, I was telling you another example. We like some product, but there is no product available in the market. You find somewhere that product, you go to the search and you get ready to give 10 rupees more to get the product. Means there is a supply shortage of the product. Because of the supply shortage, the prices are automatically goes up in the system. So that's why as the supply shifted to banks world, you are automatically the prices went up. This is where we call as a cost push inflation. So uh, we we'll talk on this one this one. Okay, what are the major factors for your the cost push inflation? One is that the wage cost, the profit, import prices. The wages increases high, we demand more goods and services. If the goods and services are not available automatically, the prices will go up. The profit also. And if we have more profit, we have more demand for your goods and services. The last one is the import prices. Because crude oil, if crude oil prices goes up very high, import prices goes up very high when you have an importing country. India is basically importing country. When the crude oil prices goes up very high, automatically your prices will go up in your a domestic economy. As a result of that one, because of increase in the crude oil prices, other factors also get affected. As a result of that one, it is a cost push inflation in the system. That's a higher prices of commodity, oil price shock of 1973-70. Higher wages, higher food prices, these are all of higher taxes. Okay, and related to this one, uh, recently there was some study by people, uh, by the big economists, that said that why the food prices are increasing drastically in India. One is that continuous, you can see that continuously uh, by 7 out of 9 double digit inflation episode because of drought lent. Because there is a drastic supply of your goods and services in your country. Because uh, this year only we had it better than compared to a couple of years back. Because of no rain, all your bore wells, other, it is drying up. So where do you find a source of irrigation? Where do you find a uh, supply of your goods? Basic commodities are not supplied to the market. Automatically what happens is that it leads to the double digit inflations. So this is a few studies they said. Again, uh, there was, uh, we had a 7th pay commission. 7th pay commission, 5th pay commission was a central government in Sudden so increase in the salaries by 20,000, 30,000. So what happened? With sudden increase by the salaries of the employees, automatically the excess demand was put in the system. But there was no supply. If other side there is a drought, other there is no supply of the basic commodity in the system, but other side your income is growing, then you demand the more goods and services. That's why we are importing all the... I never heard it. Uh, what is this? I call dengu fruit. This is a, what is this fruit? Red color? Dragon fruit. I call dengu fruit that one. Because it's more good for the dengu uh, patient. It has a more use. So this uh, dragon fruit, I never saw. Nowadays we are importing that one. Kiwi. 
again uh, made some other foods. All of these are not a domestic market goods, but we are importing all the basic commodity because there is other side. There's a demand for this product. Whatever the price is, we are buying it. Hundred rupees they give two or three. The PS or the, the, the big food they give hundred rupees three or four. But we are ready to buy because income has increased in the country. Because of that one, what is happening is that we are importing more goods and services from the other country. As a result, our money is flowing to the other country. If the same thing is produced in your country, the everything is inside your country. You are more depending on your country for goods and services. So earlier we never imported wheat, but now we are importing wheat also. We destroyed the Punjab. Punjab was one of the big source of wheat supply, but today we don't have the supply of wheat from the states. What is happening? Today the farmers are moving towards the commercial crops than the normal crops. I had a data, but I deleted it. Thought that it takes a lot of time. People are moving to the commercial crops. The cotton, which are the commercial wheat, they have more revenue because in a normal crop they find that there is no profit for them to cultivate. So in this way, what happened is that over a period of time, we are our supply is coming down from time to time. When the supply is coming down from time to time, other side, the income is increasing, the population is increasing, the demand is increasing for your basic commodity goods. Now how do you fulfill this match? How do you fulfill your gap? There is no only source of fulfilling the gap is importing the goods and services. When you import the goods and services, automatically the prices will be higher than the compared to what the basically the goods and services are available in your system. So in this way, what happens is that there is a few things which we can see that this is what I like that what are the component of your money supply is that we we take this one as a broad money supply for calculating your the money supply in the system. So M1 is the demand deposit with the banking system, other deposits with the RBA, less saving deposits with the post office. And here the reserve money which is uh, with the bank is that the currency in the circulation in the country and banker deposit with the RBI is that is what you are the state or or CR or other things and the other deposits with the RBI. So when we merge M1, M2, M3, this is your broad money in the system which is considered as a calculating of money to supply. So M1 is this one, M2 uh, deposits come. So time deposit with the bank system, including all this one, we call it as a money supply for which it is circulated in your system. So, what are the major efforts we can look into the to uh, overcome the, the supply, the constant? What is the scrapped import duties on edible oil? To import more, there is a more demand for your goods and services. We should scrap import duties. Banned export on, see this is a way uh, export of basmati rice. I think we should export more goods to the foreign country, but we stop no more exports because there is a huge requirement for the best countries. Again, our pulses and other, we used to buy us export all the pulses and other things, but we told that no more export in the, this category. Why? Because domestically the supply will come down. It is it changes from time to time. Why we do this one is that to control the outflow of the goods from this country. For the seller, it is a profit for him to sell in the international market. But the same goods are available required for this domestic market. If the same goods are required for domestic market, then we should bring a policy that no more export of this commodity. Why we are doing this one? To see that demand and supply matches. By doing this one, we can bring down our cost push inflation in the system. This is a something about like this. This is a recently uh, demand side factors. What are the factors which the demand side factors influence? One is that the peak I told you the peak commission of what? Automatically, the more income into the hands of the people, the more demand for the goods and services. Again, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, where we provide uh, 100 days of employment where the income is given to them, that is also creates your uh, more income among the people. Again, the fiscal deficit, rising form wages and transmissions. Okay, these are the few factors which are trying to see that the demand side factors are pushed. 
So how do we control this one? One thing is that creating a more supply, controlling, bringing down your physical deficit, controlling your money supply. No excess money on supply flow in the system. By doing this one, we can able to match your demand and supply. If you are not able to do that one, your economy, Indian economy, is going to suffer a long-term inflation problem in the system. So these are the demand side factors and supply side factors. Demand pool inflation is one of the factors, increasing the money supply, public expenditure, then disposable income, consumer spending activities, and cheap monetary policy. These are the few things which will inject more demand in the system. These are the important factors which contributes for your demand pull inflation. When it comes to the cost push inflation, your wages, import prices, and one more profits. These are the factors how it will allow people to spend more on the economic activities. So by doing that way, your economy is in the inflation. So one side is demand pull inflation, other side is the cost push inflation. So if I give, if you get this question in your exams, you should explain that how what is the demand pull inflation, what are the factors that affect the demand pull inflation, how can we reduce these factors, both the side. These three things should be demand side factors, cost side factors. By doing that one, you should you can explain your demand pull inflation and the cost push inflation. I'll leave to ask here. <coughs> so this is a more important point. The physical uh, stimulus was provided to them because in 2008-9 crisis, we want to create a demand system. So we created a physical uh, stimulus package which is given to that one. But at the same time, there was a drought in the country. There is no much production in the country. So what happened is that income is more in the system, but supply is not there in the system. Automatically, it is a government-created uh, kind of inflation in the system by uh, giving more stimulus package. So automatically, it led to the food uh, rise in the food prices during the mid-2009 period. This is our two side demand side factors and the supply side factors are there which influence your uh, inflation in the system. Stop you By looking at the historical data of UK uh, for about a hundred years, they found that there exists an inverse relationship between unemployment rate and rate of inflation. Inverse relationship between unemployment rate and the rate of inflation. What is this inverse relationship between the unemployment rate and inflation rate? So they were telling that they were telling that if inflation goes up higher, your unemployment will come down. What is this logic behind this one? If inflation goes up, your unemployment rate will come up. If the rate of unemployment comes down, the inflation will go up. What will be the logic behind this one? For reducing unemployment, the prices in the form of higher rates of inflation has to be paid. Why? <coughs> then automatically the prices will go. Higher inflation, lower unemployment. study they found. It 
is low unemployment, higher inflation. This was a study found, this was a totally different study compared to the, the earlier stories. They found that from 100 years record, there is an existence of inverse relation between whenever the economy is in high inflation, automatic unemployment rate is coming or unemployment is, rate is very low but inflation rate is very high. That's what, for reducing unemployment, the prices in the form of higher rate of inflation has to be paid and for reducing the rate of inflation, the prices in terms of higher unemployment has to be borne. What is this logic? I mean, If you understand this uh, logic, then only you can understand that why the higher inflation is better for your economy and to reduce the unemployment also. Or the lower the unemployment rate, higher the inflation. We discussed just now. Lower unemployment rate, higher inflation. People have more money to spend. Demand, demand, demand increases, so automatically inflation goes. Okay, one, uh, one valid. What else maybe? Or we, we, we think in this direction. Inflation rate is very high, unemployment is very less. What is our supply curve says? What is our supply curve says? Supply curve. What is the relation between the price and supply? In the supply curve. When the supply comes down, the price is down. Demand is demand curve is downward sloping. The supply curve is upward sloping. What is the difference between these two curves? I told demand is from the consumer point of view. The supply is from the producer point of view. So what is the difference here? There is an inverse relationship between the price and demand. But here, there is a direct relationship between the price and supply. What does it say? A producer is always willing to supply the goods and services at higher prices. Why so? Hmm? Why? The producer is always willing to supply at higher prices. Because he earns a more profit. Does he hold the profit like that? No. He invests. He expands the business. When he expands the business, automatically he requires people. Automatically he employs more people. So that's where they found that reason is that the higher inflation, when there's a higher inflation in the system, automatically your unemployment comes down. When there's lower inflation in the system, that's not why some countries are having a deflation. Japan is in the deflation. Why? They are, whatever they are producing, there is no incentive to produce the goods and services in the system. Because the prices are already low. When the prices are already low, the farmer is not having any interest in producing the goods and services. They only should target for the export market. If that is also not there, then it's a problem. So that's what the Phillips, they found that there is an inverse relationship between your the rate of inflation and unemployment. Whenever the rate of inflation is very high, automatically your unemployment has come down and whenever, whenever the rate of inflation is very low, the unemployment has increased in the system. <coughs> now, the, that the actual clip score from the rate of 60s, 1961 to 16 for the United States as shown in the inverse relation between the unemployment and inflation. This is what the trade-off uh, presents that for the policy makers, should they choose the higher rate of inflation to cut down the unemployment or the low, lower rate of inflation to increase the, the unemployment rate in the system. But this is where your equilibrium curve. As we can see that as the prices of your economy is going, your real GDP is 
increasing the system because as the prices goes up actually if 10 rupees one product is there if it becomes 20 rupees the income is flowing to their economy the real gdp is the increasing system so as you can see initial aggregate demand is ad curve and the given aggregate supply is uh, aggregate supply curve is as as aggregate supply is a constant on that aggregate supply constant your demand is increasing as your demand is increasing your the prices are increasing as a result your income of your economy is also increasing so this is your phillips curve where the higher price the lower unemployment rate in the system the same thing happens so that's what increase in the aggregate national of means that increase in the employment of labors therefore reduction in the unemployment rate so but this did not hold for the long time in 1971-1973 excuse me so what happened is that in the right in this period the supply side shock was created because of that one the prices were also increased unemployment rate also increased and we call it as a, a stagflation when the prices also increase unemployment rate also increase we call this period as a, a stagflation so that's what we can see that during 70s the strange phenomena was interest in us and when there exists a high rate of inflation side by side high unemployment this was a contradictory to the Phillips curve where in the Phillips curve the high inflation rate low unemployment but in 1970s onwards up to 1991 they saw the strange phenomena where the inflation was also very high unemployment was very very high and which was a contrary to the what Phillips curve was telling that so the simultaneous existence of both high inflation rate and high unemployment in the 70s and early described as a, a stagflation so this is after 1979 the economists saw the different kind of a structure in their data and by seeing that data they found that there existed a stagnation so in the 70s the phillips curve collapsed in the system that theory was no more valid in the system that telling that they whenever you the policy maker should not think that whenever there is a high inflation in the economy there is no chance that there should be a low unemployment because other way we can think that whenever there is a high inflation in the economy demand for the goods and services will come down as a result of that one what happens the production activity will come down and unemployment rate will increase so that other way also we can think it but that that was a phenomena they observed during that time so there is this one so this is because according to keynes he is a keynesian is a, a famous economist he said that the higher occurrence of inflation rate along with the increase in employment was witnessed during the 70s and early it was due to the adverse supply shock in the form of four fold increase in the, the price of your oil and petroleum product uh, because of this was the one of the reason why that high inflation rate high unemployment rate was created in this because one of the major reason for that one is that adverse the supply shock and increase in your the price of your uh, price of your oil this is fine and this is not required much this is the same thing as well okay thank you same thing to ask